Boop robot means it's time for recording. Okay. Hello, everyone. Hi. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Michael Beaver. I am the vice president of the Von Braun Astronomical Society. And tonight we're going to have Frank Shin, our wonderful facilities director, talk a little bit about lunar astrophotography as well as planetary astrophotography. However, first, we have a gift. We got a gift from the Astronomy League because we're a part of the Astronomy League, in case you didn't know. So I opened it up earlier, so I didn't look silly when I stood up here and tried to open up the document um, and to make sure it wasn't like, well, to make sure it was actually what it was supposed to be. So they gave us an Astronomy League calendar. I don't know who's going to get that. One of us, I suppose. Get the bite for it. And he gave us a piece of cardboard. If anybody wants a piece of card for it. <clears throat> and they gave us a lovely thing to read. 2021 marks a very special year for the Astronomical League. It's the 75th anniversary. Over these many years, the League could not have become the most respected national organization that it is today, and it could not be able uh, to offer all the many benefits that it does without the valued and often unrecognized efforts of its many volunteers, such as you, meaning us. As a way of expressing our thanks and close as a complimentary limited edition 75th anniversary pin for you, our society's outpour. <gasps> That's me! <laughs> Never mind, the pin's for me. I didn't actually read it yet. The League very much appreciates all you do to bring amateur astronomy to our society uh, and its members. We hope you wear the pin proudly. And close our two complimentary items, the Astronomy League 2021 calendar. Proceeds of annual calendar sales go towards funding Alcor Jr., a new, a new youth program uh, held yearly at Alcon. Uh, we also thought you might enjoy the astronomical use of three inch fridge magnet. Where's the fridge magnet? There's no fridge magnet in there. I'll have to look again. Uh, if members in your, in your club would like to purchase their own items, please refer to store.astroleague.org. Uh, the 75th anniversary pins are limited supply. We suggest ordering soon to ensure availability. If anybody wants one of those, they're available on the Astronomy League's website. Um, and as a reminder, this year's outcome will be virtual. Oh, fun. That's for me. Um, stay tuned for complete information, blah, 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 from the officers and staff of the Astronomical League. Thanks, Astronomical League. Yay. That's great, Frank. But here's the pen. That's pretty cool. You guys can take a look at it later. I'm taking it all up. It's fine. Because they said it was mine. Anyway, uh, there was a, we have a few officers here. Uh, I know that. Eric wanted to have a quick word. Do you want to come up, Eric? Sure. So I am your wonderful treasurer. You can hold me upon the end. Um, so our fiscal years uh, run from uh, July 1st to the end of June. So I just want to give you a recap. Given we had COVID this year and everything was messed up, had almost no operations going on. Um, as of right now, we've got $55,685.30 in our accounts. Um, our income last year, we had budgeted $20,870 of income, mainly from planetarium shows, memberships, and um, you know, uh, gift shop sales, that kind of thing. We only took in $5,581, almost exclusively from memberships. So that's only 27% of our budget. The good news is, as a board, we decided we're going to limit our spending uh, drastically. So uh, we had planned to spend $18,305 on our annual budget. Uh, we only spent $7,311. So uh, that was only about 40% of our budget. So we only had a net reduction of $2,452 on the year, even with COVID. So uh, I just wanted everybody to know we're still in good financial straits. Uh, I know to probably say more about the plan for reopening, but hopefully we'll be reopening here in the next couple months and have income coming in again so we can continue to you know, maintain the place and uh, do the upgrades on the telescopes and all those sorts of things. So, thank you, Eric. Right. Give a round of applause, everybody. Yeah. 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 do you have anything that you wanted to say? You just want to sit there? I understand. <laughs> Did you have anything that you wanted to say about facilities, Frank, before you actually do your presentation? No. No? Okay. Well, oh, hey, Chris, what's up? Sorry. Yeah, I tried to finish this beforehand. Uh, I do have a Okay. Okay. 
a thing that you were allowed to do. Cool. Right. Who are, are you, Chris? Awesome. Who are you, Chris? Explain who you are. Hello, my name is Chris Barrow. I am the VBOS webmaster. And I would like to share with you some good news. We have flipped the switch. Our new website is live. Go to vboss.org. You will see it, hopefully, once it's cached. And if you notice anything is missing, please let us know. There's a contact page and a contact email address, webmaster at vboss.org, that you can reach me at. And please let me know if like anything else transferred from the old website to the new website. He's the one you yell at. That's right. That's his job. Cool. <laughs> Anybody else? Thanks, Chris. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. He's working really, really hard on that, as well as the, the, the team from the, uh, what was it? It was the UAH. That's right. I'm talking about their names, Tammy. It'll be on the new website. Okay, yeah. Okay. Classic UAH did a fantastic job organizing all the information for us. Very good projection, Chris. I really appreciate that. <laughs> okay, so we're going to begin our actual presentation. So, Frank has been our facility director for a very long time, as well as a very long time member of the board, as well as the boss in general. Um, he's highly skilled in multiple fields and is ridiculously a wonderful person. And I hope you all please really enjoy this presentation from Frank. I'm super excited about it. He's going to be talking once again about lunar and uh, planetary astrophotography. So everyone give Frank, please, a round of applause. And let me get your presentation pulled up. Okay, you have the. Uh... I did have the booklet and I totally forgot about it. Can you like this? <laughs> cool. Okay, lunar planetary imaging. This is a little bit about myself. I got my first telescope when I was 13 years old, 62 millimeter, 2.4 inch refractor. I was at the time living 20 miles from downtown Manhattan, New York City. So I became very interested in lunar and planetary because that's about all you could see. I think you could see third magnitude stars if you were lucky. <laughs> And then after that, when I you know went out in the world, I lived in you know, Washington, DC, Baltimore, Maryland, Atlanta, Georgia. And now the real darkest skies I've ever had outside of Huntsville. That's pretty bad when you talk about dark skies. <laughs> this is the darkest skies I've had. Anyway, lunar planetary imaging. Now, should I ask you which button do I push? It was just working. It was literally just working. You saw it work. Everyone saw it. Oh, oh, oh. Okay. Thanks, Chris. Okay, basically, there's two types of imaging lunar, lunar planetary, and deep sky. And I just thought I'd point out the differences between the two types of imaging, and actually quite radical differences. I mean, deep sky, you want dark skies. Planetary imaging, you don't have to worry about light pollution. The moon is no problem. Deep skies, you want low humidity. Planetary, humidity may actually help. Deep sky is extended large tar targets, like Many, many arc minutes or even degrees. Planetary, very small targets, most of the targets. I mean, Jupiter is one of the biggest planets we can look at, 50 arc seconds. Very small. Mars is about 25 arc seconds when it's close. Deep sky is best done from the mountains. Planetary from the Gulf Coast, Caribbean. And for as far as telescopes go, deep sky, the bigger the telescope, the better the aperture better. Planetary, you want a well-collimated telescope with high-quality optics. 
Sometimes larger apertures work against you with planetary imaging. Okay, history of astronomical imaging, 19th century, everybody did drawings. That's all there was. 20th century, one of the biggest things to happen to astronomy since Galileo, photographic film. This was a breakthrough in deep sky astronomy. In 21st century, electronic imaging with CCD and CMOS cameras. Okay, 19th century, everybody did drawings. They did drawings of planets, they did drawings of deep sky objects. And I just named some of the deep sky objects, open globular clusters, nebulae, and something called spiral nebulae. And actually, when I was growing up in high school, they were still calling them spiral nebulae, the Andromeda Nebula, M31. It's not a nebula, it's a galaxy. But nobody knew it in the 19th century that this was a galaxy. Here's the thing about photographic film, and more so with electronics today. You and I has a refresh rate of 30, 60 frames a second. Every 30th of a second, you and I starts over from the beginning. However many photons you, your eye has collected within a 30th of a second starts over again. Film was totally different. The longer film collected photons from a telescope or just looking at the sky, the dimmer, dimmer objects you got. It's like you would stare at a cluster and see more and more stars the longer you stare. That's the way film worked. And this actually was a, one of the biggest breakthroughs in astronomy. Once they had film in the early 20th century, that's all they used. They didn't even look through a telescope anymore. To look through a telescope might be to line it up, and that's about it. You took, took pictures with film, some of which were hours and hours long and revealed fantastic detail with no chance of seeing with your eye. And this is where they found out the so called spiral nebulae were actually galaxies, separate galaxies beyond their own galaxy. 20th century planetary imaging, not so good. Totally different story. Here's a photograph taken with the biggest telescope in the world, 1952, 200 inch. That's Jupiter. Doesn't look very good. On the right is how planetary imaging was done in the 20th century. Pencil, paper, looking through the telescope, they didn't look through the telescope. I mean, these are really nice pictures. These are 1920s and 1940s, small telescopes. They really look fantastic. They didn't look through a telescope and see this. Typical planetary imaging in the 20th century is you look through the telescope, you stare at a blurry image of Jupiter for a couple minutes, and you might have five, 10 seconds of good seeing. And you try to remember what you saw for five or 10 seconds that write it down, wait another couple of minutes, and you get a few seconds of good seeing. And these pictures were made that way. They might've been sitting at the telescope for a very long time, waiting for a couple seconds where everything cleared up real nice and then all of a sudden went bad again. So they didn't look through a telescope. And I wish I could look through a telescope and see an image like that. Well, if I was on the moon, I probably could. Okay, how can I get this movie to play? This is why you could not take photographs. Now, if you look at this picture carefully, you can see the two bands of Jupiter. You may be able to pick out details. I put on my computer. When we film, you have to take a four second exposure. When you took a four second exposure or a six second exposure to this, you're just going to get a big, gigantic blur, which is what happened with the 200 inch telescope picture. Right? about. Okay. The film was not very sensitive. Why did you have to take four seconds? Jupiter, it's the third brightest object in the night sky after the moon and Venus, magnitude minus two minus three. Still with film, it took sometimes four to six seconds to take an image of Jupiter. And Jupiter is wobbling all around and going in, going in and out of focus. Just, just didn't work. As you can see with CCD and CMOS with electronics, 
a whole different story. This is a planetary webcam. It started out with CCD, probably not starting in 99, going up to 2010. And today, most of the cameras are CMOS. Prices $249 to $299. They actually cost more a few years ago. Prices are going down every year. They're not cooled, unlike deep sky cameras. They don't have to be cooled. They come in either color or monochrome. Okay, well, the first thing people ask, color or monochrome, which is better? Actually, originally, monochrome cameras with the red, green, and blue filter were much better than color cameras. But with new algorithms they have for stacking and processing images, the color camera is about just as good as the monochrome. It's a much easier to use. And I put a reference in here in an article in Sky and Telescope on 2014. The guy actually showed the difference between color and monochrome. You really couldn't tell much difference. Now, the top images in the world, and I'm not one of them, they go with monochrome because it's, you know, a couple percent better. I'm still trying to, but I'd rather go with the color camera. Much easier to use. Okay, one thing about any kind of imaging camera, you have to have a filter with it for IR. All the cameras today, planetary imaging cameras, will, 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 will be able to detect red, green, and blue light and IR light. Now, if you have, if you have a regular S SRL, you're not going to have this problem. It has a filter. And some of the first planetary imaging cameras had to filter, filter out the IR. But the cameras today do not have a filter. You're doing a monochrome camera for red, green, and blue, your red, green, and blue filters are fine. They will not allow IR to get through. If you want to do a monochrome image or a color camera, you have to use a IR cut filter that cuts out all the IR. Or the other option is, you could use an IR pass filter, which allows only IR to go in. Yeah. What does IR stand for? Infrared. Sorry. Sorry. Infrared. You can use IR infrared pass filters, 610, 685, 742 nanometers, it's common ones they have right now. I also have an 800 nanometer. Why do we have to use that one now? Okay. Well, what does this involve, planetary imaging, CCD, CMOS camera? It's called lucky imaging. You take a movie, 30 to 150 frames per second. This results in big files. Depending on it's Jupiter, file might be megabytes. If it's the moon, file could even be gigabytes. I took four shots of the moon last night and I ended up 65 gigabytes. If you take this movie, you have thousands of frames. The software will go through this movie and sort the frames of the movie by quality. You can then tell the software, okay, you sort it by quality. I want to stack the best 500, the best 300, the best 1,000, whatever you want of these frames. Now, the length of the movie is limited by planetary rotation. If you take, it, if you take it, a, a, a movie of Jupiter, you can only go for about a minute. Maybe you can push it to a minute and a half because Jupiter rotates very fast. That's like a nine hour, nine hour day or something like that. It's crazy. If it's Saturn, you can go about three minutes. And the moon, you don't have to worry about it because it doesn't rotate at all. Okay, things that can adversely affect planetary imaging and observing. And I'm going to give this to people who are interested in imaging or just looking through a telescope because a lot of they have a lot in common. You have the same problems. Whatever's going to be bad for imaging is also bad for observing. First one is telescope collimation. Collimation means make sure everything in the telescope, the optics are set up properly. I'll go into a little more detail later. 
Next one is C, atmospheric turbulence. And another one which we just learned about a few years ago, and this is a real bad one, atmospheric dispersion. I'll explain what all these are. It's really quite interesting. One of this I just learned about within the last couple of years. Telescope collimation. Telescope must be collimated as good as you can get it. If you have a refractor, a Maxitov, don't worry about it. It's been collimated at the factory. If you have a Newtonian or Schmidt Cassegrain, you definitely have to call them. I just want to say a little bit more about this. When I was doing planetary, mostly visual observing, before I started doing imaging back in the early 2000s, I was reading all about what's the best telescope for planetary. And for, for years and years, they were saying the only telescope for planetary is a Maxitov or a refractor. And the reason was refractor does not have a central obstruction, a secondary mirror, which can distort the image. The Maxitov has a very small central obstruction compared to, let's say, any other kind of Cassegrain. The other Cassegrains have a much larger. And this was the excuse. This is why. Schmidt cassegrains grains were no good for imaging. Newtonians were no good for imaging. And that's what they thought. 1999, Dr. Donald Parker, Miami, Florida, medical doctor, not an astronomer, just an amateur, took a Newtonian, put it on Miami Beach with the new CCD camera, started to come up with fantastic images. An electrical engineer over in England, and then Damien Peach, Heard about this, went to see Dr. Parker. Dr. Parker told Damien Peach everything about it. Damien Peach used a 14 inch Macassa grain. In fact, the telescope's no good for planetary. Damien Peach has produced pictures of a quality of such. Astronomy Magazine had two pictures. One was an image taken by Damien Peach of Jupiter, one was taken by the Hubble Space Telescope of Jupiter. And the idea was guess one was which? I mean, the sky is good. So Newtonians and Schmidt Castle grains can take fantastic images if they are well collimated. What's collimation? What you're looking at is an out of focus star, except for the middle one. The middle one's an in focus star. You're looking at an out of focus star, and you're looking at the shadow of the, the uh, secondary mirror. You got to tilt the secondary mirror, or in the case of a Newtonian, tilt the primary mirror so that this donut hole, the shadow of the, of the secondary is exactly right in the middle and you have a symmetrical circle. That's what collimation is. Number. Okay. Collimation. The other thing is seeing. Seeing is atmospheric turbulence. About six or eight years ago, out in my backyard, two nights in a row, I took some images of Jupiter. When I looked at them, I couldn't believe it. Left image was taken in my backyard. Same telescope, same, same everything. Poor seeing. Next night was good seeing. Unbelievable. And with infrared, actually, the, see, the effect of bad seeing is actually lesser with infrared. Infrared should be better, but this night was a very, from very bad seeing to very good seeing. There's many different apps you can get. One I use is the uh, Clear Dark Sky. You can get it for almost any geographical location in North America, including some place called Von Brown Observatory. And this here will tell you cloud cover transparency and seeing the most important, the other one's cloud cover, you don't want cloud cover. And you really need good seeing, just, just to even look at the planets, you need good seeing. Okay, here's the poor seeing movie. I think we've seen this one. Okay, let's go to the next one. Oops, too fast. So, movie again. 
this is a good scene in the movie. When you see this, wow. I mean, it's not the clearest image in the world, but it's not shaking very much. That happens about once every, you know, once every three months. Sometimes she seems to change overnight. I was looking at the moon one night. For about 20 minutes, I'm looking at the moon, it's getting close to sunset. And on the left, this is a screenshot. It's not a processed image, it's just taken right off my computer screen. You can see how blurry everything is, and all of a sudden, around 5 30, right at sunset, the scene just cleared up, and all of a sudden, it was really good. I couldn't believe it. How nice it was. Okay, atmospheric dispersion. Let's talk about atmospheric dispersion. Something I learned about two years ago, Gary Cassie, our uh, planetarium director, actually told me about it one night, and I started studying it. And I learned more and more about it. This can really, this can really have a detrimental effect on, on how you planetary imaging. This is the appearance of a star and telescope at high magnification. You never look at stars at high magnification. There's no use of looking at trying to magnify a star. Stars won't magnify. It's called an airy disk, named after George Biddle Airy. What, what you, you are seeing is a result of diffraction. You see the central star and the rings around it, the rings are caused by diffraction. You probably will never see it this well unless you have an extremely good high quality telescope and extremely good seeing. But this is what you have, and it's the airy disk. And as far as seeing a star, when you see a star, you see a star for one reason. You see it because it is bright, not because it has size. Trying to see a star, even with a telescope, as a disk, it's like trying to look for your eye and look at a, a bacteria or a COVID virus. You're not going to see it. It is much too small. I've seen it referred to as a mathematical point of light. Star through a telescope, no matter what you see, you're seeing something which is so tiny. We have seen one star. We've seen a disk on one star. Hubble Space Telescope saw Betelgeuse. The big star, if you put Betelgeuse where our sun is, we'll go out to Jupiter. The Hubble Space Telescope saw Jupiter as a 0.2 arc second disk. That's the only star we ever saw a disk. You're not going to see sunspots on stars. Okay, airy disk. Why am I talking about airy disk? Why does that have to do with climate range? Let's do with atmospheric dispersion. This is a star through a telescope at 30. Degrees to 90 degrees above the horizon. Star at 30, 35, 40, even 45 degrees above the horizon. If you looked at it through a telescope with very 500 power, it would look like this. We say, so what? What does that have to do with it? Mean, you're not going to look through a telescope at a star and try to magnify it. All I'm trying to say is this shows, can you imagine what happens to a planet? The same thing is going to happen to a planet. Planet's not going to look like a pear. It's not going to look misshapen because it's a real disk. It's not an airy disk. But what the planet is going to look like is blurry. So what's happening to a star? The star is being distorted. What's happening to the planet, which has a real disk, the real disk you can see, it's just going to be blurred. As you can see by looking at this, in the bottom row. Basically, we're saying if the planet happens to be in Scorpius, Sagittarius, Capricornus, where Jupiter and Saturn have been and are still right now, you're going to have a heck of a time with atmospheric dispersion. If you come back in eight years from now, you'll be up in Gemini or Taurus and it'll look like the bottom, the bottom row. And it'll look much clearer. Or you can go down to Australia right now and Jupiter is beautiful. You know, for Australia or South America, South Africa or something. What do you do about atmospheric dispersion? That's what Jared told me about. Atmospheric dispersion corrector, $128. And they work. Whether you're doing it visually, I've, I've done it visually, I've done it for, for, photographically. Here's another thing about dispersion. On the left, you see atmospheric dispersion of a white star with a luminance filter. 
Yeah, it looks like chromatic aberration, basically atmospheric chromatic aberration. We use a red filter, what kind of star or planet? Yeah, no dispersion. Green filter, some, blue filter, terrible. So if you're going to look, if you want to look at planet, you don't have dispersion correctly, especially in terms of Saturn, this is very good. Try a red filter. You will get around the dispersion. Here's an here's image of Jupiter with, 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 with and without atmospheric dispersion correctly. You can see the difference. Okay, lunar planetary imaging, high resolution imaging, looking at extremely fine detail. You're approaching the greatest possible theoretical resolution, generally using very high F ratios, greater than F20. Nobody makes an F20 telescope. You use a borrow lens, that's how you get the F20. Short exposure times, milliseconds, not seconds like we used when we had film. And you have colored monochrome cameras. How does it work? Short movie, big files, software sorts the frames, and so software stacks the best frames when they noise. Frames are going to be noisy. Problem we have with film, the problem we still have with electronics, when you try to turn up the sensitivity, or if you have cameras, turn up the ISO. With the gain too far, it's going to cause noise. Fortunately, the noise is random. You have a bunch of images that have random noise and specific features on it, like the belts of Jupiter. When you stack them together, the noise is random, the noise will cancel out. Yeah. Okay. Noise, okay. I'll show you a picture of noise in, in a minute. Here's, here's, a, here's a stacked image of Saturn, and I'll show you noise. And stacked image at the sorting from thousands of frames. And then you do something called wavelet processing. I don't understand it. I have tried deconvolution, and deconvolution does the same thing. It's, I call it magic. <laughs> It brings out detail. It's a Fourier transform. At one time in my life, I knew what Fourier transform was. I'm sure there's a lot of people who work with it that know, know more about it than I do. Okay. Look at the image on the left. It is noisy. It's a single video frame. Noisy noise is random electronic noise. You can look at it, you can see it. It's little speckles. You take 500 of these noisy frames you see on the left, and you stack these 500 noisy frames together, you have a much smoother frame. You had noise with film, it was called brain because film was made up of brains of silver iodide. You had noise with electronic cameras because it has pixels and the pixels have electrons. Sometimes electrons don't behave the way you want them to behave. So here we have a single frame, noisy, stack 500 together, stack them lines. Then you go to register stacks, wavelet processing, and get a nice clear image. You also do a color balancing. There's a, there's actually a button on register stacks called color balance. You just hit the button, you don't have to go automatically. If you do it on register stacks, you can do it on Photoshop. It's just like an automatic thing that was it works beautiful. Here's some pictures I took of Jupiter. Left one is uh, red, green, and blue or visible color. Right one is infrared, 685 nanometers. Here's Saturn. Saturn actually works very good with infrared. Most of I mean, if you look at Saturn, not in the rings, you don't see features. You don't see things on the belt. You don't see little clouds. The features on Saturn, the clouds, the features in the clouds of Saturn are visible only in infrared. 
you can glimpse them with red, you can get them better with infrared. If they're deep down in, in the atmosphere of Saturn, you can bring them out in infrared. Picture on the right is a combination of infrared and red, green, blue, or color. I use a color camera, I use took some videos with an IR cut filter with a color camera, took some videos with the IR pass filter, which were monochrome and red. And I just combined them together in Photoshop. If you look at the picture on the right, you look at the top belt right below the pole, you can actually see some white little tiny white oval signs. And those are only visible because of the infrared. Why did I mix the infrared with color? Because it looks nicer. But I just wanted to see the little features on it. We'll just use infrared alone. But infrared and color it makes a nice looking picture. Here's Mars again, infrared 742 nanometers and the green blue or visible light put together. The infrared makes the features look much sharper. Now the moon. Moon is one of my favorites. I mean, moons are actually pretty good. I mean, you got Jupiter two or three months out of the year, and you got nine months of nothing. Saturn two or three months out of the year, and it's gone. Mars sticks around for about one month every eighteen months, and the rest of the time it's so small you can hardly see it through a telescope. The moon is always there. I, I know the. Some of the deep sky images, I'm not very happy about it, but <laughs> <laughs> if you're doing, if you, if you like, if you like the image of the moon or like the look of the moon, observe the moon, it's always there. And, it's, and you think the moon's the same all the time. You always look at the same face of the moon. Not true. Uh, I point to the picture on the right. I took that picture in 2018. I wasn't even planning on it. I just looked through the telescope. I said, I'm going to take a picture of that crater. Man. After I got done, I crossed it the next day. Oh, good. I want to get one, another one of those pictures. Okay, it was one day after full moon. All I got to go is go out one day after full moon. I get another picture just like this. Guess what? The moon actually goes through its whole cycle, in, not in 28 days, but 28 points, I don't know, three, five, seven, two, nine days or whatever. So if I see the moon like this and I go out the next time, 28 days later, the shadows are going to be either too far to the left and the crater is going to be in the dark, or the sun's going to be too far to the other direction and the crater is going to be flooded. I have not been able to get another picture that even resembles this picture since 2018. Because every, every month, it's a little bit different with the moon. And also every night, every night you look at something on the moon, it's a different story. And all the good stuff on the moon is the Terminator. The only one time I don't, never look at the moon is when it's a full moon, you can't see anything. Everybody, when I was a kid, everybody said, oh, it's a full moon tonight. You're going to take your telescope out? And I just smile and say, yes, yes. <laughs> it's the worst time. That's like taking deep, deep sky images. Somebody says, hey, it's a full moon out tonight. You're going to take a picture of far away quasar? <laughs> Here's another thing in the moon. I, I've been trying to reproduce this picture and haven't been able to find it again. This is a rill on the moon. It looks, looks like a riverbed. It's actually caused by falling in the crust of the moon. Here's, here's another one. This, this is the Alpine Valley. Uh, the lunar Alps uh, were hit by a big, gigantic meteorite at a glancing angle. A few, billion years ago, producing this gash. And after this, there was a river of lava flowing down the gash. And the little river you can see there is actually just cut out by lava. I point this out. This is one of the hardest things to image on the moon. You have to really good seeing and everything else, good camera decolumation to get that very difficult detail. Here's the other thing, these are called lunar domes, little puppy things. They look very obvious here. If, you, if I tried to take this picture six hours later, you wouldn't even see them. These things are, some of these things are one or less than one degree slope, 70 meters high, only when the sun is at a very, very steep angle, are you able to see them. They'll disappear. 
what you see tonight, you might not see later on tonight, and you definitely won't even see them tomorrow. It's very hard to find. Mm -hmm. Okay, planetary imaging. What's the most important thing? The most important thing in planetary imaging is the focal length of your telescope. Focal length has to be matched with pixel size of the camera. Nothing to do with the aperture of the telescope or anything else. And here's a formula, and you can use this formula to figure out. I'm not going to go through the math. It's pretty simple. It's called a sampling. And the proper sampling is 206 times the diameter pixel divided by the focal length. It's a very simple, simple thing. And you can decide, you can change your focal length by using various types of borrower lenses. Here's what's the important thing is what happens to shorter focal length. Image on the left, too short a focal length. Image on the right, much better, much better sample. Here's, here's a crater at F10 and a crater at F30. F30 is much better. This is good sample. You have the proper focal length. On the left, you have you don't have the proper focal length. You can see what the difference makes in the image. There's a way you can get around the focal length problem though. You took a picture and you don't have a borrow lens or you took a picture and it's, it's, it's a bad picture like I just showed you. It's something that's the whole space telescope had the same problem. Some of their images, it's too short a focal length. The images weren't clear. They could have used the borrow lens, when they took, but they wanted to make sure they had a wide enough field of view. So they developed this algorithm for stacking images called Drizzle. You can look up and read about it. It's fantastic. It works very well. I always use it on all my lunar images, whether I need it or not. It always comes out better. Basically what Drizzle is, you have a camera and your camera has 2,000 pixels. It takes those 2,000 pixels and it makes them into 3,000 pixels. It does that without messing up the image. It's some really good math and some really good thinking went into it. And actually, they have proven on the Hubble that using Drizzle, you can take a poor image and you can not only come up with a better looking image, you can come up with better resolution. It actually increases the resolution. I saw an article on that uh, last year. It's quite amazing. Here's when I first learned about Drizzle. Got the 14 inch, 16 inch telescope upstairs out. We were working it about 10 years ago. And on the right, it's what my image of Jupiter look like. Not very impressive. I use Drizzle on it, and I think it on what? So if you, to, if, you, if you did not match your pixel size of your camera well enough, to your focal length, you can go back and do drizzle. Okay, lunar planetary software. The good thing about it is camera software, the stacking software, the wavelet processing, it's all free. If you want to do it further, you can use Photoshop. You can get away with the first three, they're all free. Most cameras. Will detect color, color monochrome will detect IR. As I said, you may want to use IR. IR is not affected by atmospheric dispersion. Infrared, infrared is less affected by seeing. Infrared will penetrate deep into the cloud with Saturn and reveal small details, not otherwise visible. IR filters for lunar energy. If you're going by the laws of physics, the best thing you could use would be a blue filter. And if you're up in the moon, the whole space telescope is probably right. Blue wave, blue light has a short wavelength. The shorter the wavelength of the light, the sharper, the better image you're going to get. The only problem with using a blue filter on the Earth is we have an atmosphere. Our atmosphere is scattered blue. That's why the sky is blue. When I do lunar imaging, I always use either a long pass red or an infrared filter. Uh, Damien Peach uses blue filters. He's, he's imaging from Barbados. 
which is on the equator, which means the object is over here, has it's an island in the Caribbean, just the best possible scene you can get. Alabama, Alabama, I use infrared all the time. Visually, if you run over Jupiter through a telescope, now you're percentaging. Try a green filter. It will enhance the red spot and the blue clouds. It'll look darker. And also, if you use green filter versus no filter at all, you're going to have less dispersion. You're going to have a certain amount of dispersion of green, but if you have no filter, you're going to have all kinds of dispersion. Saturn, red filter. <clears throat> And imaging infrared will show deeply into the clouds. Okay, here's some references. And I'm not going to go over those. You can look at the presentation later in the room. If you have any questions on planetary observing pollination, you can email me. Or you can see me when I'm up here most Saturday nights when I'm from, from in town. I'll be up here on Saturday night. Let's make a dog show. And, and right now, I'm sorry, I do have my telescope set up and the moon is out. And if the moon is still out, I can actually show you a little bit what the moon looks like through, through an image, imaging camera on a computer screen. And on the bottom, you can see I'm trying to become an expert in planetary imaging. I'm just about reached expert level in lunar imaging right now. <laughs> and I'm going to try to find some images. Thank you. Does anybody have any uh, questions for Frank? Yeah. Frank, I was surprised that you said that you still need an IR filter and color uh, camera. Color uh, filters don't filter out the IR filter. Uh, if you have a color camera, the color camera has a built in what's called a Bayer matrix four pixels, red, green, green, blue. Those red, green, green, blue filters on the camera do not filter out IR. They, they just transmit a, transmit the IR perfectly. So they're strictly visual. Strictly visual. Now, if you if you're using a monochrome camera with a red and a green and a blue filter, the imaging imaging filters they will cut out IR. But the filters built into the camera do not cut out the IR. And this is done on purpose. This is because people using a color camera may want to do color imaging, and they want to do IR imaging. Yeah, they don't cut, they don't cut it out. It's, that's just the way they're made. The other question, yeah. I, I use fire capture. It's similar to shock cap. They both, they both basically do the same thing. So I like fire capture. Yeah. Do you worry much about your solar? Not really. <laughs> um, here's, here's the crazy thing about planetary imaging. If you're doing deep sky imaging and you're looking at us trying to image it, a star, let's say, or a bunch of stars for five, 10, 20 minutes, you want to have perfect polar alignment, but you want that star to stay in the same place. When you're doing planetary imaging, it's actually an advantage that the planet is drifting across your field of view. Actually, you want a certain amount of drift. It has to do with noise. No, no chip and optical system is perfect. There are imperfections in electronics, imperfections in the optical system. And as Jupiter is drifting across the field of view, it's getting different imperfections all the time. When you stack those 500 images, all those imperfections are just going to cancel out. You have a piece of dust on your camera. You have perfect polar alignment. That piece of dust will be there the whole time. You're getting a good image of that piece of dust. You're doing imaging Jupiter, and you got a piece of dust in your camera, and each, each frame of that movie is 10 milliseconds. Well, the dust is on this one, that's on this one, this one. You'll never see it, it'll just disappear. 
So you actually do not want a perfectly polar line. line. And I just, one of the references I put up, and this is something I wouldn't do it, but one ex expert planetary imaging from France, planetary imaging with an altazimuth Dobsonian telescope. <laughs> it's, it's hard to do. It's hard to do, but you could do it. And he's done it. He has results to show for it. So, so, right. so yeah. with long exposure stuff, he did things like uh, dark frames. Exactly. Line frames. And that's like you calibrate each individual pixel. You don't do that with the planet. No. So by letting it grip or rotate or whatever. Right. So it, it's sort of like an automatic dithering. Right. Kind of exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's a good point. I should say that next time. I'll do no dark frame, no flat frame. Right, exactly. So you don't want a polar misalignment. You don't, you don't really call a misalignment. You put it close, you know, close enough. I look at the polar axis. Oh, yeah, it looks like it's looking at flares. <laughs> I mean, for years, I was doing visual imaging and I had a refractor. My polar alignment was, oh, flares is up there. Plop it down. It looks good. It works. It works. I mean, you're not doing any more than, I mean, for Jupiter, you're not doing any more than 60 seconds. For the moon, you might go, might go four or five minutes with the moon. But since, you know, one shot of Jupiter is 60 seconds, I mean, you can keep it within, oh, yeah, you got to, you got to continuously up, operate the control and move it, make sure it stays in the field of view. Yeah. So focusing in the way. Is the uh, Saturn? You focus on Cassini vision. It's really easy. Jupiter is more difficult. Some people say focus on one of Jupiter's moons. Uh, Damien Peach says focus on the clouds of Jupiter. I've tried the clouds, I've tried the moons. But Saturn and Cassini division, definitely. Um, more as you can focus on the features. Uh, more can you see craters? And craters, definitely, definitely. And what about the edge of the planet? Like the edge of the planet? Uh, edge is not good. You have edge effects sometimes. Usually, usually the planet itself is better than the edge. Yeah. So you said you could take, like with Jupiter, you can only take like the moon, uh, video for like a minute. But the moon, so you really know a little bit. Sure. Is there is there a limit in the benefit of the if Can you just keep stacking? If you get good, if you get enough good frames, you just keep stacking to get a better, better image. Uh, some at some point it gets to the point where where it's you know diminishing returns. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, but theoretically, general, theoretically, you want more. It keeps getting better. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing about the moon is the moon you you use very very low gain. I mean, with low gain, you have hardly any noise at all. And you can also go for minutes and get a lot of frames. You cannot use low gain on planets. I, I never knew why until Damien Peach explained it in one of his talks. It's called an onion ring artifact. If you have a picture of Jupiter and it starts looking like onion rings, for some reason I cannot explain, if your gain is too low, you will get this onion ring artifact. So you gotta use about 50% gain or 50% of the max ISO. For Jupiter. Well, any planet, any planet. For the moon, for the moon, which is a totally different situation. I mean, and it also has to do with stacking. When you're stacking a planet, you have a single planet, and the stacking algorithm is for a planet. When you're stacking the moon, you have a big surface. When you do this stacking software, there's two choices you have, planetary or surface. If you do planetary on the moon, you're going to get something that looks like it came from Picasso. It doesn't, I swear, that's what it looks like, exactly. It doesn't work. I don't understand the stacking algorithms, but it's, it's a totally different story. Yeah. Uh, I thought I saw <clears throat> Parity
Yeah. Yeah. Oh, more. Oh, more. Did I, did I actually see? Bold was better. Yeah. But it was fuzzy on the IR on the pole. Yeah. The one, the one on the right was IR plus color. It was also taken at a different time, probably four years apart, three years. I can't remember. But I've had I I had very good. I've even had good pictures of the pole. It depends on the night. Depends on the weather. Every night's different. It depends on the scene. I have a picture up here that one of the pictures you buy. It's a perfect scene, by the way. A picture of Saturn in that postcard. I mean, you, can, you can see you can see the pole really nice. That was perfect scene. I'll never forget that. 2014. Put Saturn in the telescope and I'm standing there. What is wrong with this computer? It's frozen up. Yeah, this one here. I'm looking at it. It's frozen up. Computer's been, why is it not moving? And all of a sudden, after about 20 seconds, I saw a little ripple of movement. And I realized I just saw a perfect scene 2014 waiting for it to happen again. I mean, this was perfect. <laughs> I mean, it looked like a still picture on a computer screen. That never happens. And this is with my first generation CCD camera. I didn't even know what I was doing. I could think of 20 things I would do now to make it better. And this is the best picture of Saturn I ever got. <laughs> we actually were in Barbados. <laughs> Frank, in all of your years of imaging at uh, Planetary, have you found it better to do early evening, middle, late morning, or, I mean, early morning? Uh, they say it's supposed to be good right at sunset. I experienced it one or two times, other times I haven't. Uh, biggest problem with morning is I went down the valley in the morning everything fogs up in the morning. Up here, up here, probably would work much better, but the morning's hard to get up. Uh, yeah. Do you understand the bottom of I I did do that once. It's possible to do it. It is possible to do it. You need a good quality borrow. I do know that. But you can do it. So we did it once at French Camp. Dr. Ratchet and I did it. It's got a bunch of bottles. Yeah. Right, the thing that people used to do was uh, I teach projection. You don't need light projection. I don't, no. Have you ever known what it does? Like I heard about people doing it. I've never, I've never tried. Okay. I don't I don't know the advantage and disadvantage, but I just I use my borrowers. I've seen people do it. I heard about people do it. I tried. No, nobody talks about it. None of the books, nobody ever talks about it. Just projection. Danny Beach talks about borrowers, just because they're all the experts. They talk about borrowers. Uh, you mentioned the ASI people. I used to do 24, yes. It's a uh, when it first came out, Damien Peach recommended it for Uranus and Neptune because it was sensitive to infrared in addition to being a good color camera. You can use it in infrared. And right, right now I got I got a 462, and the 462 has phenomenal infrared. Normally, if you go from visible to infrared with the camera, the infrared the the uh, brightness drops off, even with the moon. You get the moon with uh, no filter, it's bright. You put a red filter on, it's dimmer. You have to turn up the, uh, oh, you either have to turn up the gain or uh, take a long exposure time. Put an infrared filter on the moon, you have to take even longer exposure time. The new 462 chip, it's in a color camera. The 462 chip, I can go from red to 685 infrared to 740 infrared. I see no difference in sensitivity. It's phenomenal. It's, uh, 
just came out a few months ago, and I knew I had to get one right away, and I did. It has phenomenal infrared sensitivity. I'm going to try it on Uranus and Neptune. Uranus and Neptune, uh, we talk about difficulty. These things are small. I mean, Neptune is about as big as one of Jupiter's moons. Just think of turning image one of Jupiter's moons. And you have to use infrared. And you have to use a long exposure. You can't use a millisecond exposure on Uranus and Neptune on the sixth and eighth magnitude. My gosh, Jupiter's minus two magnitude. I mean, exponentially, right? But with these very sensitive infrared, and you need infrared in Uranus and Neptune to see the clouds, to see anything. This way, not the same thing. Infrared, you will see some sort of resemblance of a, of a feature on it. Yeah. Frank, you want to take a, uh, take a shot at telling us what the, the minimum focal length might be practically for, for doing planetary. A lot of us have short focal length cameras where we're doing uh, deep sky imaging. Is it, is it even worth trying with something under? Uh, if you have a good bottle, yes, you have a good bottle. Hmm? If, if you have a good bottle of lens, you can. You can. As long as you match the folk, the actual focal length with the bottle. Now, Damien Peach says, make sure you have a good quality bottle. And when I say good quality, I mean Teleview or, or a known brand. I don't know for sure, but that's what that's what he says. Make sure the bottle needs to be. It, 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 you can get around it with a bottle. I mean, they, they make five power bottles. I think I used a platinum two once or something. On some platinum, you stack them. Yeah, stack them. Yeah, you can do that. You gotta, get, you gotta get that right focal length. And, and with the moon, you can do drizzle. Some, sometimes it works with plants, sometimes it doesn't. But drizzle works fantastically with the moon. I wish you do all the time. I don't, see, I don't know why with the Hubble they couldn't just reach up and clean the bottle. <laughs> but then, you know, that would, have, that would have decreased the field of view. That was the other problem, you know. Fine. Any other questions? Is your question with your cameras? Are you focusing it on zone of interest to reduce the number of pieces of image? I. Well, this planet, I usually, I limit this, the field of view of the planet. I don't have to, but it keeps the clouds from getting too big. But the moon, I mean, sometimes limited. I know it's something I don't want to bother with. I limit it, but sometimes I just take the whole thing, full frame. And it depends what I want to do. If I take the whole frame, it's going to, you know, each file is going to be about, I'd say, Single video file, one shot, eight gigabytes. When I think back, my first computer was one gigabyte. <laughs> yeah, eight gigabytes for now. But, you know, electrons are cheap. All right, are there any more questions for Frank? Go in once, go in twice. All right. Frank, I know you want to get your telescope set up. Um, do you want to go take a look real quick? And I can say a few yeah. things. Make Thank sure you. that everything is looking good outside. Yeah. Thanks, Frank. Thank Thanks, Thanks. Thanks. Moon is up overhead right now. I have my telescope out there. If I can get it working, I can show you what looks what imaging looks like on a computer screen with an imaging camera. Okay. So I'm going to stop the recording here. Everyone say bye to the Zoom people. Bye.